guys have been looking at this week and will continue to look at has been limitless. The first verse that comes to my mind when I think about this idea is Philippians 4 and verse 13. Where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I or any of the rest of the teachers tell you that you are limitless, I want you to understand what we are saying. What we are telling you is that you are not limited by the things you have done in your past, your past failures, your present fear, and your anxiety of the future. These things do not limit you or your ability to serve in the kingdom of God. But I'm going to present a caveat tonight to this idea. Now, for those of you that don't know what a caveat is, a caveat is presenting an idea. While this is true, here's something that's important to know that you could get in trouble if you don't understand this. For instance... If I were driving down the road with you, or riding with you rather, and I told you that safe drivers stay at the speed limit or below it. Now, why that is, while that is true, the caveat to that would be, if you're going to drive slower, you need to stay in the right lane. Amen. See, there is an importance to that, because if I didn't know that while I'm driving slower, I need to stay in the right lane, I would be in the way of those that need to drive quicker or are driving quicker. They don't really need to. You see, that's what I'm going to do tonight. You see, your theme has been, I am limitless in Christ. You see, in Philippians 4.13, there are things you need to understand. Number one is that we serve a limitless God. And secondly, that I can only be limitless if I'm in Christ. But here's the caveat. The, the statement that we're going to look at tonight is this. How to be limitless with limitations. With that in mind, I want you to open up your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to begin reading in verse 24 going through 27. 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24. Paul says, Do you not know that those who run a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul, in several, several of his writings would use the analogy of running in a race and equivalating that to the life of a Christian. He would do so in 2 Timothy 4, where he would say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And he does the same thing here in 1 Corinthians 9. He's talking about the life of a Christian, but uses the analogy of a race. You see, as a runner in a race, or in our case, runners in the spiritual race, we are limitless in Christ. And again, what we're meaning by that is I am not hindered, I am not limited by the things I have done or am going to do. But because I am in Christ, because I serve a limitless God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But just because I am limitless doesn't mean there are not limitations to the race. You see, there are three major limitations or boundaries, if you will, in every race. The first one is the starting line. If you don't start the race where you need to, you are not going to be running it. 
Secondly, you have to have boundary lines. In other words, there has been a path laid out for you in the race that you must follow if you are going to run the race, race the way Christ wants you to. And thirdly, there's a finish line. You see, I can start the race where I need to. I can run the race the way I need to. But if I don't finish the race where it has been marked for me to finish, then I got nothing out of it. You see, while I as a Christian runner in the spiritual race am limitless in Christ, there are still limitations set on the race. That's what we're going to look at tonight in the short time I'm with you. I'm going to keep this relatively short. But how am I as a Christian to be limitless with limitations? It sounds contradictory, but when we look at it, it makes a lot of sense. Well, first off, you have to start the race. It doesn't make sense for you to run a race that you haven't started just like in a real race, if you don't start at the starting line, then you are not running in the race. You see, I can stand outside somewhere and just say, well, this is my starting line. This is where I feel like I should begin my race. But in the end, if I did not start where I'm supposed to start, then I never really started running the race. That's one of our limitations. You see, while you can be limitless, you still have to stay within your limitations. You have to be in Christ. You have to start the race. Now I understand most of you understand what it means to start the Christian race. To begin your life with Jesus Christ. I understand most of you get that. So I'm not going to spend relatively any time on that. But in order to be in Christ, you have to understand who He is. In Acts 2 when Peter preached the first ever gospel sermon, he would say, or the people in response to that sermon would say, men and brethren, what must we do? They understood what they had done, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had came and had died on the cross for their sins. And they responded with, what do I have to do to be saved? Where do I begin my run with Christ? Peter's response was repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. To be in Christ, you have to repent of your sins. In other words, this is what I was doing, and I'm going to go to the polar opposite side and do this instead. Instead of serving myself, instead of serving Satan, instead of living in sin, I'm going to serve Christ. I'm going to, I'm going to give a total flip. And you have to be baptized. That's one of our first limitations is that you have to begin your race. You have to start the race where God intended for you to start it. Secondly, you can start a race where you need to. But the only way that you're going to qualify for the reward is if you ran the race the way you were supposed to. In cross country, the path that has been set out is not clearly mar as clearly marked as it is in things like track, where you have specific lines painted on the track, where this is where I have to stay. But in cross country, you have a path that has been laid out before you that can take you through many different things. It can take you through the trees. It can take you through the mud. It can take you over the hills. But whatever comes on that path, in order to qualify for the reward, to stay on the path, you have to get through those things. And it's just the same with the Christian walk, with the Christian life. There, have been a, there has been a path laid out for us. And we see in Matthew it is a narrow path that has been laid out for us. A path that we have to stay on if we are truly going to finish the race the way God would intend us to. In Romans chapter 12... I want you to turn there with me. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul shows us what it looks like to stay within those boundary lines, if you will. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy 
acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, if you're going to stay in the boundary lines or within the path that God has laid out for us, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, as a Christian, and I'm speaking to those who have started your race, that you began, you are in Christ, you've obeyed the gospel. That's not where we end. That's where we begin. But when you begin your race in Jesus, when you begin that spiritual walk, that spiritual fight, as Paul would call it sometimes, you have to stay within the boundaries that God has set for you. Though you are limitless in Christ, though you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength, though you are not hindered, though you are not limited by the things you've done or the things you're going to do, as long as you are in Christ, you are limitless. God has set limitations on how you should live. Limitations on how you talk. Ephesians 5, 29 says, Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that, but that which can edify and build up those who hear it. I'm going to walk through some types of language. For a moment, I want you to answer for yourself whether it's corrupt communication or if it edifies. Gossip. Does it edify? Cursing. Does it edify? Lying. Does it edify? What I want you to understand is if you responded no to any of those, it automatically puts them in the corrupt communication category. And by default, it's sin. Paul said that only things that edify and build up should come out of our mouths as a Christian. That's a limitation that has been set on us. Just because I'm limitless doesn't mean I get to make up everything I want to do. And part of that is realizing God set a boundary on what should come out of my mouth. And that's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to look cool. But in the end, if we are truly going to run the race the way God intended us to do so, we have to watch what we say. Not only has God set limitations on how I talk, He set limitations on how I worship. John 4, 24, God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. There are ample passages that discuss what we as Christians, how rather, we as Christians should worship. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, and again John 4, 24, and many other passages. Jesus shows us what we as Christians should do in worship. But not just keeping it biblical, but also keeping the spirits in our worship. Do we understand what that means? What does God require from worship. You see, when we think about truth, we think about, oh, well, we should keep it the way the Bible says. We don't, we know we don't use instruments in worship. You know, we don't do all of these things. But we don't talk about the spirit of worship. That's about an attitude. What kind of attitude do I bring to worship? Do I come because my parents made me? Or did I come because I wanted to? It's something we all struggle with at times is keeping the right spirit in our worship. But it's a limitation that God has set on us, even though we're limitless. But this major idea that Paul is trying to get across here in Romans chapter 12 is that though you are limitless, you have limitations in your life. As a Christian, you should look different when you go to school. If you talk the same, if you dress the same, if you look the same, if you act the same, if you watch the exact same things that your friends do in the world, you're not going to look different. 
You're not going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're going to be conformed. And Paul said to stay away from that. You're never going to bring people to Christ if you don't look different. The reason Jesus said that you are the light of the world, what he was trying to help you understand that is he wants you to be different. He needs you to be different. You see, the only way your friends at school are going to ask you about Jesus is if you don't do the same things that they do. If you don't say the same kind of words that they do, they're going to wonder why you don't and they're going to ask you. And that's going to give you the opportunity to show them Jesus. If you don't watch the same movies that they do, they're going to ask you why. And that's going to give you the opportunity to show them Jesus. Jesus didn't ask you to be different because he just wanted you to look weird. He asked you to be different because he needed you to. No one's ever going to find out about Jesus if we don't show them. And that's why he gave us these boundaries. He kept us to keep us in the race, to keep us, number one, from not losing sight of what we're running for, but also to help us get others on the path to finding Jesus. Although we are limitless in Christ, God has set limitations. I have to start the race where God told me to start it. I have to run the race where God told me to. My friend told me a story. He runs uh, cross country. And the path took him up this hill. And it was almost towards the end of the race. The race was almost over. Everyone was exhausted. And they came to this hill. And it was a large hill. And you had to run up it to get to the finish line. And at that moment, him, as well as most of the other racers, looked at the hill and one of two things came to their mind. One, some of them just wanted to quit. The hill looked too large to get over. It looked like it wasn't worth it. But others looked at that hill and thought, can I not just go around it? You see, they had full intentions of once they got off the path, once they got around the hill to get back on the path. But both of those people thought that they could run the race in a way that it had not been set up to run. You see, if, I, if they would have ran around the hill, even though they intended to get back on the designated path, they would have become disqualified. If they would have decided that the hill was too large for them to run over and they would have stopped and just walked off the path and gave up, they would have become disqualified. And it's the same for us as Christians. We're going to come to some hills if you're going to be the kind of Christian that Jesus requires you to be, I promise you, you're going to come to some hills in your life. And you have to decide what you're going to do with those hills. Are you going to stop? Are you going to say, look, it's not worth it. This hill is too large. This obstacle is too large in my life. It's not worth being a Christian to go through this. Or maybe you're going to look at the hill and go, well, it is too large. And so I'm not going to be the kind of Christian Jesus wants me to be. But just for now, I promise that I will get back on the path later. Just let me get through this. And I promise, Jesus, I will get back where you need me to be. But just not right here. Not right now. Or are you going to look at the hill? And you're going to say what Paul said when talking about the Christian life. Let me run with endurance the race that has been set before me. As we close, there's a third boundary line, a third limitation that you have to deal with when you run a race. That's the finish line. You see, I can start the race where I need to, and I can run the way, race the way I need to, but if I don't finish the race where I need to, it was all for nothing. We've really already looked at that. See, I can begin my life as a Christian the way God would have me to and I can live my life up to a certain point the way a Christian should. But if at any point I look at my life and I say, look, it's not worth it. I didn't finish the race in the place God would have me to. Now, let's be honest. You have to ask yourself the question, what's the point? 
If you haven't asked that question, I think you should. What's the point? What's the point of starting a race, the spiritual race? What's the point of running that race and the boundaries that I should? What's the point in finishing it in the way that I should? What, why does it matter? What's the point? Why would I live my life in such a way that it would look different for my friends? That would maybe put me in a place where I would get made fun of or left out. What is the point of that? And is it worth it? I want to leave you with 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 7. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. Paul again talking about your life, your run as a Christian. Would pin this to young Timothy. He would say, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. And not to me only but to all those who love his appearing. What's the point? Is it worth it? Well, you have to answer that for yourself. I can answer the what's the point. You see, if I live my life in such a way, if I run the race the way I need to, Paul said, there is laid up for me and you a crown of righteousness. What he's telling you is that there is a slot in heaven specifically for you. Jesus died for you to give you the chance to spend eternity in heaven with the one who made you and the one who died for you. That's the point. That's what it's about. You have to answer for yourself, is it worth it? I can't answer that for you. That's something I want you all to answer. Is it worth it? I hope it's yes. But the Bible teaches that for most it will be no. As we close, I'm going to give the invitation. It's always open. But maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. You've not began your walk with God. You've not began that race, that spiritual race. You're not in Christ Jesus. And you want to change that. We can change that tonight. And, and that means you know what you need to do. Maybe you don't know what you need to do, but you want to be in Christ. I would love to study with you personally. Or maybe you are a Christian. I would assume a good portion of you are. But when you look at your life, and you look at the race, the spiritual race, you realize I haven't been running in the boundaries that God has set for me. While I am limitless in Christ and what I can do for Him, I've not been staying within the limitations God set for me. And you want to change that. You want prayers to encourage. We can do that. If any of this applies to you, come talk to me. We'll help while we sing this song.